Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much, Masafumi, for a very inspiring opening to our conference, and of course to Anna and her colleagues for uh, getting us together in Milan for what's going to be a very inspiring conference. Uh, it's my great pleasure now to introduce the first plenary of the conference, and there couldn't be a more appropriate person to deliver this than Professor Patrick McGorry, uh, who, of course, is one of the great instigators of early intervention in psychosis. So, Pat, it's a pleasure to hand over to you for your uh, first plenary of the IEPA 10. Professor McGorry. Well, thank you, Peter, and uh, good morning, everyone. And I'd just like to start by, first of all, thanking um, Anna Menigeli and uh, Angela Cocky. Very sad to say that Angela is no longer, no longer with us, but I think the title is good because it allows us to look back and acknowledge his incredible contribution. And later in the conference, there will be a special award uh, on, um, in, in memory of Angelo and uh, all the Italian colleagues, I think, as well. So. It's great that um, the meeting is in Milan, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this meeting. Okay, so as Masafumi said, it's a very exciting time in early intervention because we're broadening the focus. Uh, we've been trying to do that for some uh, few years, and it's finally happened with the name change. Um, we've got the biggest attendance we've ever had at one of these meetings, and a lot of young people, which we really need, as Masafumi said, to keep this momentum going and you can really feel it I think this is a very special conference so what I'm going to do is try and look back a little bit and I just felt completely overwhelmed when I did that because we've had 20 years of these conferences and it's impossible to really capture what has actually happened in, in this in this area in that time so you have to forgive me what, what you'll see is a fairly, fairly idiosyncratic backward look and then I'll try to look forward uh, and hope uh, um, and it's just really a personal view of, of where I think things should be going. So, so okay, this, if we only we had a time machine, yeah, uh, that would be, help us a lot because uh, we could change a very fundamental mistake, which, um, which was to kind of build the pessimism into, into the whole idea of uh, particularly schizophrenia and psychosis. And it's taken us a good 20 years to kind of detoxify it to the point that we can feel much more optimistic about outcomes and now look more broadly. And I just want to, um, I, Masafumi put up a picture of Ian Falloon which was very appropriate because he was a really creative, forward-thinking person that uh, got this field moving. But I think the first people that really focused on first episode research were these two first episode cases. Um, uh, the person on the left is Tim Crow, who led the Northwick Park studies in the 1970s and early 1980s. Um, purely from a research point of view, I don't think there was much interest clinically at that point. Um, and secondly, on the right, John Kane, who is, is here at this meeting and will be speaking about the RAISE project. And he did uh, key studies in New York in the late 70s in first episode, which then led to the whole hillside uh, first episode focus. So um, I think it's very important uh, to acknowledge their role. And in Australia, we, we began in the 1980s um, with a, a, a research focus, but we immediately embraced the clinical side as well. And, and the fact that there was a, a building focus in research on first episode uh, psychosis really helped us to get our work going. It might as well have been um, 1884 as 1984 in terms of the thinking of the people at the time because the 19th century thinking was absolutely everywhere in those days and I think we have caught up a lot now since then. So we developed out of that something called EPIC and, um, and then I think through a whole series of fortunate events um, uh, Tom McGlashan visited us and connected us with our Norwegian colleagues and you could see the Viking spirit was very important to progress this field. Um, it hasn't been an easy fight and uh, the Norwegians, uh, the Arnold Johansson colleagues organized this very special meeting in Stavanger in 1985 and um, that led in turn to um, <clears throat> this meeting which was kind of fortuitous. There's the first 
this is the 10th meeting here today, but the first meeting we, uh, that we called the IAPA meeting was in, it was in Melbourne in, in 96. And it was really lucky because there was a big international meeting in Melbourne at that time at which many of these first episode researchers, and I'll mention Max Birchwood too, who spent a sabbatical with us around that time as well. Um, but all of these people were speakers or participants in that meeting. And it was only because they were there for something else that we were able to, to capitalise on that and, and, and create this focus, which then led to the IPA. So, and that was a very critical thing, organising you know, leaders in the field from different parts of the world to help each other and work together. And that's been an amazing experience in this whole network, I think. And obviously there's a lot of other people, there's hundreds of people that have contributed that aren't on that slide. So that's a, just a quick back look and, and uh, lots of other things happened in other countries too that I haven't mentioned. But um, let's try to capture some of the headlines. And I realise looking at the abstract book that this is, this is probably incredibly inadequate, what I'm going to say next. But it's, it's just my top level, high level take on what, where we are really. The first thing is the DUP issue. Now that was fought and, and uh, it was controversial for a number of years. It, people tried to say it was just an association, but um, the TIPS project showed that it, it did actually have a long-term effect. If you reduce the DUP, there were benefits that lasted for many years. They were modest benefits, but they were definitely worth having. Um, and combined with really good clinical care, uh, it's quite clear we can change the, the, at least the early course of illness. The other sort of big area um, that Alison Jung and, and, uh, and I and other colleagues in Melbourne began very soon after we set up EPIC was this focus on the ultra high risk or prodromal period. And uh, this has been a phenomenon really in terms of the, the research side. If you pick up a schizophrenia journal, probably a quarter to a third of the papers in, the, in those journals now are taken up with this, this area of work. And it's Despite the controversy that sometimes gets associated with this, it's, it's clear that we can actually predict and actually delay the, the, the transition or the progress into psychosis uh, for, the, for the patients that we can find at this stage of illness at least. And that is a very big thing. It's a very big thing. If someone had said that to me 25 years ago that you could do that, I would have been very impressed. But that is the case. And um, the transition rate you know, is probably, you know, we, we're, un, we're learning now that transition isn't the only important thing, but transition rate in this meta-analysis is 36% over, over three years. If that was a blood test, it'd be a highly valuable one. And we can actually improve that prediction. A number of studies, this is from the Naples group, we can improve that prediction. Um, at least in research samples, to a much higher level, adding in a number of extra variables. So, and obviously there are ma major studies going on in Europe and North America and Australia trying to um, improve that prediction using biomarkers and imaging and other kinds of variables into the, into the mix using uh, analytic techniques like machine learning, for example. So <clears throat> this is the prediction side of things. It's become a little bit more complicated, which fits in very well with the transdiagnostic idea that psychosis is a more widespread phenomenon than ever anyone realised, thanks to the work of Jim Van Os and colleagues in the Netherlands. Um, you know, but um, so the prediction capacity depends on really how close you are to the clinical uh, need for care, if you can put it that way, and uh, other comorbidities. But um, so it's a little bit more complicated and, and also the transition rate <coughs> for reasons which are still a little bit unclear is reducing when we do these studies now. So it's kind of pushed us more in the transdiagnostic and, and multiple outcome direction and away from this narrow focus on schizophrenia and psychosis. <coughs> and this is a, a paper from, uh, led by Alison Jung and our PACE group and, uh, uh, which showed uh, other studies have shown this too now, that other outcomes are very common, in fact more common than psychosis. So the, the majority of the patients will have persistent mood and anxiety disorders, um, often comorbid with persistent psychotic symptoms. So it's, it's very messy in, in some ways if, if you want to look at it that way. But um, there's still value in these criteria because they do predict a sort of a, a problematic and uh, guarded course if they're not properly treated. 
<coughs> so we're indebted to Mark van der Kaag and others have done meta-analyses on these studies now, but they pulled together all the worldwide data on the RCTs that have been carried out in this ultra-high risk stage. And what he showed was that the risk reduction is 50% over the first year or two. So you can reduce the risk of transition by 50% by a range of interventions, and it, it, almost is, it, it almost doesn't matter what you do, as long as you do something to help the patients. And, and um, obviously the safest thing to do is to provide them with psychosocial care, and it's very influenced by CBT in most of these studies, so um, the patients benefit from that in, in a number of ways. And um, I think Mark is gonna present um, new data on longer term outcomes of the Netherlands uh, EDI, EDI trial here today, that's among other uh, presentations in that space. So this is very positive. The, the fish oil study, one of the studies that was very positive was the omega-3 study and uh, Paul Amminger did this study in, in Vienna. We've just completed an international replication in nine centres which sadly uh, wasn't able to replicate that finding and we'll, be re we'll present the results of that um, at this conference in more detail. And we're moving on now, um, this is just our own research in Melbourne, um, with a large sort of stepwise trial, an adaptive trial, which is really just modelling the right sequence of treatments for these patients, um, <clears throat> from simple to more complex across a series of steps. And uh, so there's no really new experimental treatments in this mix, but just the sort of things that we would be doing clinically um, <clears throat> when we see these patients, but studying the right sequence. So that's a, another, th and obviously looking at biomarkers and, and other sort of... Uh, uh, ways of trying to work out which, which patients benefit from which intervention. So that's the personalised medicine idea. Now Max Birchwood co coined this term, the critical period, some years ago, back in the early 90s. And this whole first episode to, and the early years of illness is, is something that the, the epidemiological data really supports a strong focus in. So um, we now know that we can actually bend the curve, we can change the course. Of the of the of illness in those early early years, and uh, a number of studies um, have been done. This is um, Marita Nordentoff's uh, systematic review of, of of some of those studies. Um, key studies have been done in Europe, in in England and in Denmark, and also in Canada. Um, and uh, probably the most up to date um, meta analysis of this was carried out or as a systematic review, no, it's a meta-analysis, by Christoph Corell, and he kindly shared this slide with me. It was presented at the Schizophrenia Conference in April. And it's pretty clear, he found nine randomized controlled trials of what he called comprehensive uh, specialized care and compared with treatment as usual. And these are some of the findings. On almost every variable, there was an advantage for the more specialized culture of care over uh, standard care. However, the effect sizes were not huge, and there's a tendency for these benefits to actually um, decrease when the patients leave this more specialised care and go to what is usually fairly inadequate standard care. So it's not surprising in a way, and there are studies being reported here at the conference which will show what happens if you, if you extend this care beyond the, the first couple of years. And, uh, it, does, it, does, it is, does seem to be possible that you can maintain these, these better outcomes, but it does take uh, the right sort of approach. Anyway, that's something that will become a little bit clearer, I think, um, in the near future. And of course, you know, this is an important study which um, Bob Heinsen will be talking about later today and, and also John Kane in a symposium at this meeting. This was very, um, uh, what's the word, transformational. Um, uh, I think largely because it was done in the US. Uh, all the other studies had been done in other countries, but the US did this study and um, it showed, again, better outcomes in the first two years for more specialized evidence-based care in early psychosis for first episode patients. And um, especially if the DUP was short. And I think it's important to, to make this point that many of the pioneering studies were done either on reducing DUP or on um, improving the quality of care, but you really have to do both if you're going to get the better outcomes. And I think the results of Ray's really point in that direction as well. Now, the, the other thing is it's all very well for us researchers to do these great studies, but it, it's not much good for the patients in real life um, if, if, if they don't actually get 
implemented in, in the real world, in, in reform. And um, that's been another thing which has been a major, I think, um, <coughs> what can I say, um, effort of the IPA and everyone associated with it to make sure that patients everywhere get the benefit. We're not just a research conference, we're a very broad church. So we want to see patients benefiting. And in many countries, um, in many countries, especially Canada, Denmark, uh, the UK, um, the Netherlands, finally in Australia, um, and, and now finally in the US, we're starting to see this scaling up. I would also say in Hong Kong and, and, and other, other countries, many other countries too, there have been scaling ups, but in some countries it's been more extensive than others. There are symposia here talking about the politics of that and how even when it's happened, it's still fragile. The, 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 those processes are, can be undermined and, and that's an important lesson for, for, for us, how to defend these beachheads of progress. So Bob will be talking about this later, but this is quite dramatic and it might, it, you, you'll hear more detail, but this is quite rapid investment. And in Australia too, we're, we're finally seeing 20 years later, 25 years later after we started this work, we're finally seeing investment in these more specialised services in a more systematic way. And this is another key piece of the argument, um, the cost effectiveness. Um, um, thanks to Ian Hickey, our Prime Minister now uses this word mental wealth all, all the time, um, referring to the value of, of investment in mental health in, in the economy and in the society. And it's, this, is, this is probably where we've got the best evidence of, of the value of investing in mental health care. And it's, there's 12 studies, 12 economic studies, all pointing in the same direction. You save money if you invest in the early stages of, psycho of psychosis treatment, whether it's prodromal or, or, or first episode and beyond. So I don't know if anyone saw this piece in the Huffington Post. Um, I think it was late last year. And if you just read it, it, it sounds like there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a huge breakthrough, a magic bullet type uh, n a new drugs being developed for the treatment of schizophrenia and psychosis. But actually, the article is all about early intervention and, and has stories of patients who have benefited from involvement in early intervention services and, and uh, transformed their lives. So um, this was, this was um, an example of, uh, uh, I suppose, um, confidence in this approach now. Okay, so just before I talk about the next, the next phase, I just want to pick up on a couple of things that I think personally, this is my personal view, are the really important things to, that we need to, to develop further. The first thing is this paper from the Netherlands, and a lot, as you can see, a lot of this great work is coming out of the Netherlands, and this is Lex Wondering and his group, who basically of showing us how we might refine the treatment uh, of, of, of the patients during this critical period after the first episode and, and how to use the medications. Um, it's really, it was really a dose reduction study and obviously the risk with that is that you might, might get a higher relapse rate which they did actually find in the first couple of years but at seven years this dose reduction strategy yielded better functional outcomes for the patients. And, and uh, only a very small percentage came off the medications completely, but the lower doses, and we think now uh, there are several studies trying to build on this research in, in, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands, in, in um, Denmark, and in Australia. Uh, we, we hope to, with much more intensive psychosocial recovery treatments, we might actually get the best of both worlds. You know, low relapse rates plus much higher levels of recovery, because the level of recovery wasn't that great in this study, even though it was better than, than uh, with standard treatment. So this is a very exciting thing to, to make more sophisticated the treatment um, of the patients. And you, the eye fever meeting was yesterday, um, so you probably saw lots of data in this space. This is a, a key thing that we should be focusing much more on functional outcomes for the patients rather than being obsessed about PAN scores. Um, and that's, a, that's obviously a key thing. And finally, also yesterday was the IFIS meeting and uh, David Shires and Jackie Curtis and all that, that group that have pioneered this, this focus um, to tackle this shocking fact that patients with these illnesses die many years earlier than, than um, the general population for, from preventable physical illnesses. And uh, this is something we've neglected until recently. We've got the best opportunity with early intervention to actually turn that around. So I think these are, there are probably many other areas that we could highlight that need a lot more work, but these are 
these are very important. And finally, the new technologies. And, um, and um, this is Mario Alvarez's slide. And uh, it shows how you know, we can really strengthen what we do clinically and, and maybe even compensate for some of the holes in our, in our um, uh, systems of care but with these technologies. Uh, which patients in the modern era are really going to benefit from. So a lot of people, especially in Australia, um, are working hard on that. And finally, I just want to mention, uh, this, this is not picking on one group, but um, I went to Chile late last year, and we had been hoping for many years to find first episode programs in South America, and, and we know that they exist in Brazil, so that was really good. But um, the, um, the, the Chileans are at this meeting, and so are the Brazilians, and. This, we, we, this is the last sort of continent that we really want to uh, strengthen early intervention in, in, in that part of the world because most of the other parts of the world so far have actually got beachheads of early intervention. So um, I think making this a world uh, process is something very important to the IEPA. We discussed that yesterday at the board. Okay, so that's a bit of a backward look and it's obviously completely inadequate, so um, this meeting will flesh it out, I'm sure. Now, which direction should we go in? And this is just for debate, really, and for discussion. And, you know, we could make a mistake, <laughs> and uh, we might regret it, but, but um, uh, maybe we can do two things at once. I, I don't know, that's, that's also possible. Um, I had to review a paper recently um, about highlighting the fact that a certain percentage of first episode psychosis patients will present after the age of 25 or 35, whatever the upper, upper limit of our early intervention programs tends to be. And it, I think it's the minority, but um, some people say it's a bigger number. And it might be a bigger number because many patients have a lot of problems of other kinds before they actually have their first psychotic episode. So their onset is earlier, but their access to care can be later. So anyway, it's true that there is a group of patients, a substantial minority at least, who will present a little bit later in life. So how do we deal with them? I think if we just focus on the stage issue alone and not take account of the developmental and uh, contextual issues in the person's life, uh, we won't design the right type of service. You know, so this is my personal, personal view. But something nevertheless has to be done to make sure early intervention can occur for um, those older patients. But it has to be a different type of early intervention, I think, and it's something for our adult psychiatry colleagues to have a bit of a think about, you know, because they seem to be concerned about it. So th that's just one of the issues um, affecting this area. Um, if, you, if, we just, if we had stuck with a pure early psychosis approach, um, I mentioned some of the problems with the, with the, the ultra-high risk for psychosis concept, the falling transition rate, um, the fact that this is something that is, is a bit baffling in some ways, that even when you have prodromal clinics or ultra-high risk services right next to first episode services, only a minority of the first episode patients will come through that channel. Um, I think the broader youth mental health idea is part of the solution to that, but we don't know yet. And the fact that there are multiple exit syndromes and multiple other pathways apart from transition to psychosis, that suggests that if we just have this too narrow focus, we're not really going to realize the full potential of this, this approach. Um, the other problems, I've probably mentioned all of them, the, the age thing, that the fact that how do we sustain the gains that we make in the early stages of illness? It's like if we were treating cancer and we, we get the patient into, into some kind of remission and then we forget about them, we kick them out and, and, and we wait for them to have secondaries and, and, or spread of the disease before we start treating them again. We don't help them to remain well and, and, um, and, and uh, continue to recover. We, we've got symposia on this, as I mentioned. Even when you have made progress and you have a beachhead of, of, of progress of early intervention in a service system, it's still vulnerable. It's still vulnerable to, to the whims of bureaucrats or, or to the other pressures, financial pressures in the system or the, or the discrimination against people with mental illness. All of these things can happen unless they're really defended and built on. Another thing is, we know now from all the research that's been happening in 20 years what the components of a comprehensive service should look like. We've got a pretty good idea, but too often we settle for what I call epi light models, which just deliver part of what's needed. Um, for example, maybe just a detection team or, or just a, a recovery program or just an assertive outreach program. We've got to do a lot more than just one or two bits of it 
if we're going to really get the, the best results. So I think it's fair to say it's been an incredible thing in terms of proof of concept for early intervention that we did it in an area that was very pessimistic and we've got very positive uh, indicative uh, evidence. Um, but you know, it's necessary but not sufficient for the full reforms that we really want to go for. So I think it's given us a lot of confidence to go to, go to a much um, ambit more ambitious uh, focus. So how do we, as Masafumi was saying, how do we extend early intervention? And that's going to need new models and new cultures of care. Now, Ashok Mallow is another one of the pioneers I didn't mention earlier. Um, he pulled this together for the, a WPA meeting and, and a, a, a journal uh, article, which is moving from this early intervention for psychosis to this broader idea of youth mental health, um, which obviously incorporates early intervention. So that's a, a paper that summarizes that. The fact that we set, we set up the journal with a, a broad focus on early, early intervention in psychiatry, it wasn't just for psychosis, or, although this journal is the official journal of the IPA, um, so it's good that our, 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 our focus as an organisation has changed to fit that too, but this was founded to actually stimulate more work in the other diagnostic areas. And if we're going to do that, we've got to think about when, what point is the earliest we can actually intervene. And, and people have been critical of us for, they've tried to say we're pathologising normal people and we're we're lowering the bar too much and people will just get better anyway, that's kind of thinking. So we've got to define how we're going to go about that. And I, thought, I think the first point to make is, in the rest of healthcare, you, normal people are allowed to seek help. Normal people can get help. And so can people with mild, mild to moderate disorders. No one kicks them out or excludes them. Um, they don't, they're not subject to the same sort of discrimination or rationing that we are in mental health. And there's lots of examples. I won't go through the whole slide. Um, and it, it does depend on a primary care capacity for this. So primary care, there should be no triaging, there should be no censoring, it should be universal. And depending on which country you come from, that, that actually is a reality in many, many of our countries. And that means that we've got to rethink diagnosis at this, this, this stage of, of illness. And, um, as the controversies around the DSM-5, I think, highlighted how inadequate our diagnostic system actually is for early intervention it, and uh, how it's been misused in a way by um, health financing and by you know, uh, drug licensing authorities and a whole range of people for uh, which in a way that doesn't really help us move forward with this. In the research world, um, the NIMH tried to deal with the kind of weaknesses of the diagnostic system for research by formulating these research domain criteria, but they, they're no use clinically. It's, it's all dimensional. Um, there's no clinical utility of this model. It might be logical for research, and, it, and it's actually highly compatible with, what, with the idea of staging, which, which we have actually been trying to develop as a heuristic model. And as you can see, staging um, we can build it onto the, uh, this, this kind of transdiagnostic psychosis phenotype idea that Jim has been formulating. And we can, but in reality, you don't just see those people with subthreshold psychotic symptoms. You see people with subthreshold or full threshold uh, features of a range of different dimensions or syndromes. And we can call them microphenotypes. That, that's probably a, a nice word to describe what we're talking about here. And you, you don't know when you see these patients in these very early stages where, where they're going to go. Um, and, and you could see the term schizophrenia, for example, as more of a prognosis than a diagnosis because it can only be applied later on. Um, so the point being, though, that the patients have a need for care even when their symptoms are more fragmented and, and fluctuating and not, not clear. Um, and we shouldn't wait for them to be really clear before we actually start helping them in some sort of way, and that's the point. So the staging idea uh, is still a work in progress, and uh, you know, um, with Ian Hickey, he's, he's been really uh, developing this very strongly with a lot of great data, which he's going to present later today in Sydney, um, with Jan Scott um, and, and other people in other parts of the world. We've been trying to, I suppose, put it out there as a heuristic idea uh, a group of us trying to use it as a research 
tool, but also something that's going to be useful clinically, and certainly useful for clinical trials, and, and for interpreting biomarkers of various kinds. So, but it has to be transdiagnostic. There's no point in having a clinical staging model for bipolar, and another one for depression, and another one for anorexia. That's not going to work. It's against the whole principle of what we're trying to actually do. Again, uh, this is Jim Van Oss's paper in American Journal, looking at the sub-threshold phases of these illnesses. How do they actually emerge? And I think the Dutch research is very interesting here because it shows that symptoms are actually risk factors for other symptoms. And um, understanding those pathways um, is going to be critical to see how we can interrupt them. And we may not have to know about biomarkers to do that in, in, in some ways. So, um, but we don't understand enough about these pathways. And, um, how to get the data for that is a big challenge. And so things like experience sampling and, and other sort of more frequent um, uh, sampling of data of, of, of these experiences, maybe more qualitative research, I think is gonna play a big role here. So um, there, there are new mathematical techniques, particularly network analysis, which we've started to apply to transitions data that we have in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, and also some really incredible thinking from my colleagues in Melbourne, Barnaby Nelson and Jessica Hartman, and also with some Dutch colleagues, about how transitions and how, how things actually do progress. It's not necessarily a linear thing. And there are models from other areas, like, like even quite bizarre areas like oceanography and climate, you know, which actually would help us to maybe understand how these things actually occur. So um, can we apply these approaches in, in, in mental health? I don't know, but it, it's very uh, attractive as a, as, a, as a way of thinking. Biomarkers, I mentioned, obviously biomarkers might be much more relevant for stage, and I think Ian's got some really good data on that later. Um, stage might be much more important than the actual syndrome that we're, we're actually studying, although the syndrome is still possibly quite important too. And using it clinically, Ian's group in Sydney um, have used it to actually um, make decisions about treatment. It, um, and, and if you do change the treatment according to stage, the outcomes do actually improve. And we've got good data, obviously, in psychosis for that, but maybe it's more, a more general phenomenon. So in terms of the title of the talk, I think um, um, how are we going to get to, to these sorts of idealised places, personalised care, transdiagnostic care? Um, there are new techniques, new studies looking at better prediction of risk and also prediction of need and, and, and uh, outcome from early on in the course. And again, obviously, other, other domains like <clears throat> different biomarkers, imaging and so on. Testing out novel biotherapies and trying to work out um, which subgroups of patients will respond and not being just tied to do studies within the traditional diagnostic silos but doing them cross-diagnostically with these, these more promising sort of agents. Um, the psychotherapies, and, and I think here too we're seeing great modernization of the psychotherapeutic inputs um, using virtual reality, uh, new technologies, uh, supporting you know, um, these things to be much more engaging and more relevant and more effective than they have been. Um, I mentioned the... And then the final thing, just heard a patient talking about this recently, and it's a, it's a great quote, and she, she, she kind of says, you know, CBT doesn't really suit everybody, and neither does DBT, and, you know, what are they going to do, those people that don't really get engaged in those, in those more talking and traditional sort of approaches. And, and there have to be, has to be more exploration of expressive therapies, especially helping people to express themselves and, and, uh, and recover in a different way. And there's been very little serious research in, in that space. So we've got to listen to the patients uh, about that. Now, I mentioned the technology issue, and, and um, you're probably all aware that Tom Insel, the former director of NIMH, um, uh, has moved to Google. Um, and it's interesting listening to him talk how he's moved away from the importance of genetics and brain imaging through to saying things like, well, we better implement what we already know in a better way. And now seeing this technology revolution as, as, a, as a key opportunity. And, and Ian, uh, I've seen Hickey there second from the left, our health minister next to him, Tom Insel, and our prime minister, Malcolm Turnbull, and Jane Burns, who's been spearheading the use of new technologies along with Ian in Australia. So this is an incredibly powerful movement that we can just feel it, you know, um, as something that's going to be very, very important in the future. Not to replace what we currently do, because the personal relationship is obviously critical, but to make it better and to strengthen it. And uh, so I think that's a great development. 
Now, the last few minutes, I just want to talk about um, what is necessary for us to get to these early stages of the onset and to do some of these things that we've actually been moving towards. And that is this youth mental health movement, we can call it, I think. And it's pretty simple, really. We, you know, this is young people that have written this. That this is the aspiration. We want young people to have access to knowledge, skills and services necessary to respond to and support them in periods of mental ill health. And this came out of, I think, a process in Ireland that Helen Cochran and others sort of um, masterminded where we got a declaration and we actually said where we want to go with this stuff. But why, why youth mental health? You, I've already told you that some people are complaining that we're ignoring the older people in terms of early intervention. But, well, the reason is because 75% of mental disorders will appear by the age of 25. So if we're going to do early intervention, we're going to get 75% of it if we focus on this age group. Um, and 50% of young people will have a mental health problem or illness during that period of transition. And, you know, probably many of you will have seen this slide before, but it is the epidemiology of onset um, across the lifespan. And you can see that mental illness in orange there has got a very different pattern from physical illness. So we're going to have, a, we're going to, have to have a different type of health system and, and uh, emphasis and culture if we're going to help these young people and also be able to intervene early. Um, I mentioned the term mental wealth. It actually originally came from this paper in Nature um, in 2008. Um, and it just talks about social capital being built up and how, you know, this tremendous investment in getting a young person to that threshold of productive adult life. And if they break down or die at that point, it's not just a human disaster, it's an economic disaster. So we've got to do everything we can to reduce the impact on productivity as well as on... Uh, on flourishing and uh, fulfilling life. <clears throat> We've been helped by the epidemiologist who published a whole issue of the Lancet, uh, Lancet Commission uh, issue in uh, June this year, and the, which um, basically um, has got the same philosophy. And, and so they engaged uh, the Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, who, who supported this, um, and Melinda Gates. And, ma and she makes the point that the existing systems really sell young people very short. The systems are designed for children or older adults, not for younger children, uh, not, not, not for young people. And yes, yeah, some of the data. And it's not just teenage angst we're talking about. It, it has a real impact on how people function and how they succeed or not in life if, if that untreated mental ill health is not responded to. And yet, you know, this has been the system, this has been the approach for young people until very recently. We've got this great early intervention rhetoric and our government, you know, um, came, uh, endorsed our mental health commission's uh, sort of uh, uh, recommendations to, to go with early intervention, but it, it's got to be more than rhetoric. It's got to be investment and, and uh, content. Until recently, young people had the worst access in Australia to any type of health care or mental health care, 13% of young men back in 2008. Uh, that's improved, but it's still a fair way to go. And, you know, in many countries, this is the situation. All the ambulances are at the bottom of the cliff. Um, we're responding in emergency departments, not in communities, not in homes, not in, you know, primary care. So we need this new architecture and culture of care. And can we build it? That's the big question for us. Can we build it? It has to be built in primary care, and it's something between childhood and, and adulthood. That's when all the action is in, 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 in uh, terms of onset and early intervention. So in Australia, we have built in the last 10 years, it was the 10th anniversary uh, a week or so ago of this new model of care. It's a primary care, one-stop shop model. Um, very simple idea, integrated health care for young people. Different culture, different feel. And I'm just gonna show you a short video. How do I turn that on? which gives you some idea of, of how it actually works. C can we click on the, the movie? This is very new. It's just been launched about a week ago, this one. It's a Sally virtual tour. Is 12. She gets really anxious and worried about going to school. Sally's mum doesn't know what to do anymore. Jacob is 16. 
He spends all night gaming to help him escape, but he's not sure that's working anymore. He argues a lot with his family and stays out all night with his mates. Dylan is 21. He's been going through a breakup. He's been feeling down for some time and his friends are really starting to worry. Sally's mum heard about Headspace Craigieburn on TV and gave them a call. The staff at Headspace were friendly and helpful and arranged a time to meet them for a chat. Jacob discovered Headspace Craigieburn online. He wanted to talk to someone who works with and understands young people. One of Dylan's friends told him about Headspace on Facebook. So he checked them out. He wasn't sure at first, but decided to give them a go. When you arrive, you can tell us a bit about yourself and fill out a simple iPad survey. This helps us link you with the right person. That might be a counsellor, GP, drug and alcohol worker, or an education or employment specialist. Or you might choose to join a group where you can meet other young people that are in the same boat as you. With the right support and care, Headspace can help young people and their families manage the normal ups and downs of life. Headspace Craigieburn provides support to young people aged between 12 and 25 and their families. We are situated at Craigieburn Central Shopping Centre. If you're unsure how to find us, visit our website for more information. Or jump on eHeadspace for online mental health support. should have a virtual tour so you can try before you buy, you get a sense of what it's like before you go if you're a young person. By the end of next year we expect there to be 110 of these, these services across Australia, there's currently 95. Um, they're a primary care model, if you want to read about it, it's um, described in this paper in the Lancet Psychiatry a year or so ago. There's an evaluation which shows basically that access and engagement are, are much better, there are modest improvements in outcome but there are definitely some ways this needs to be strengthened and, and, and uh, I mean, particularly in certain areas. So um, it's a work in progress. Um, these are the sort of problems. The good thing is that as far as we can tell, early stage patients are the, are the predominant patient. I, that varies a bit in, in services like the ones we run um, because we've got more psychiatry expertise in those centres. <clears throat> we, can, we can treat more complex patients, but it's not designed for complexity. It's designed for primary care level input and the rest of the house has to be built, not just the front room. So that's, an, that's a, a big challenge for us going forward. Outcomes are, are generally better, but um, there's a subgroup that don't do so well, which I think Ian's group's identified quite well. And we do need to build more specialist expertise in these areas um, to complement this, um, this initial phase approach. Now, in terms of the politics of it, as well as getting the grassroots support, it's been critical to engage uh, the political leadership. So here's our collection of prime ministers that Ian and I have basically assembled over the years. <coughs> um, there's Kevin Rudd they, in 2010, Julie Gillard 2011, uh, Tony Abbott in 2013, and Malcolm Turnbull in 2016. So we've been able to kind of, um, I suppose, engage the politicians to support this because they know it's a big issue in, in terms of, um, and it's an optimistic issue. It's something they can actually be associated with, with some benefit as well. So it's been very fortunate we've been able to maintain that over the years. Other countries are, are, are definitely um, working collaboratively uh, with us and vice versa in this space. In Ireland, that's the Irish Prime Minister, Enda Kenny there, um, launching the jigsaw service in Galway in 2009, I think it was. Um, Denmark has uh, at least six of these sites, um, and that's a former Danish Prime Minister, I think, Marita, isn't it, um, who was behind that or helping with that. Um, in Canada, I mentioned Canada and the Beck Foundation, who have been incredible supporters of this reform in early intervention and youth mental health, and that's Tony Beck there on the, in the middle, and Ashok Mala, who's leading this pro project in, 
in Canada. Um, it's on the sites, very similar as you can see to, and this is in British Columbia, Steve Mathias's system in British Columbia. So, and this is in uh, Toronto. So some countries are really going for it and other, and other countries hopefully are going to get more and more engaged, we hope. In Europe, there was a youth mental health conference, which is different from child and adolescent psychiatry, I want to say. Um, was held in Venice um, a couple of years ago. And the next one of the youth mental health conferences, which is similar but, much, but quite different from this one, because half the audience would be young people, um, this next one's going to be in Ireland in September next year. So I think it's... Uh... So just in closing, um, if, we, if we just try to think about this next stage, and uh, the, slide, the slide that you see there is um, our research director, Rosie Purcell's slide. She didn't actually climb Mount Everest, but she went to the bottom, <laughs> or the base camp. So I think that's quite high up, but, but actually I think that's where we are. We're just really still at the base camp of this, of this field of early intervention. It's made a fair bit of progress, but we've still got a very big mountain to climb here. But which mountain, which, which face are we going to go up? There's some choices here. Maybe we can send teams up different sides of the mountain. 75% of early intervention will be captured by a focus on young people. If you have this broad focus, it maximizes public and political support. If, you, if you're too narrow or too fragmented, you won't get that. It's obviously the best buy in healthcare, and hence you know, the term mental wealth that's been you know, in, the, in the public discourse now in Australia, mental wealth. Niche approaches will crumble. They're, they'll be weak. They'll be divided and weak. That's been the history of, of reform in mental health. Division, um, weakness, and, and not enough confidence and, and solidarity. We've got to become too big to fail. So, and this is where the youth, there's so much public support for that from the parents, from the young people themselves, and from the politicians. We have to make it evidence-based, and we've got to, I suppose, turbocharge it with this, these new technologies as Ian and Jane have been doing in Australia, and, and my colleague Mario Alvarez too. And the challenge, which I'm, I really don't know the answer to this, how do we get specialisation, how do we get expertise um, into this equation without having to be stuck in the silos of schizophrenia and bipolar and so on. How, what is the answer to that challenge? And uh, that's the tra transdiagnostic question. So I'll stop there and I just, I, I just want to spend um, just a few seconds just acknowledging all the people that have been involved in this amazing um, process you know, over the last 20, 25 years and still will continue for another 25 years, I hope. But international um, leadership from IPA people, um, I couldn't fit them all in, but those, those are the ones that I, I could fit in there um, <clears throat> um, in many, many countries. And um, my own colleagues in Melbourne, and you know, I've listed all the researchers over the years that have actually played um, foundation and continuing roles, but I want to mention John Moran and Karen Pennell, who are not researchers, John's here. And without that kind of incredible organisational expertise and commitment that they, people like them have, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't have made the progress that we have in Australia. So I just want to say that. And um, Ian, I mentioned Ian a number of times. He's been an amazing colleague in Sydney. That's, that's a rare thing in Australia to get that sort of partnership um, between different centres and, and, and Jan Scott too, working with him. And um, special mention to Bob Heinsohn, who's going to be speaking later this morning. I think he's done a, an awesome job in America um, getting this, this whole issue funded and, and uh, progressing. And, uh, and the funders, some of the foundations, we get government funding, but the, phil the phil philanthropists of the Colonial Foundation, the Graham Beck Foundation and the Stanley Foundation, they've, they've played a key role in making this progress as well, and hopefully they'll stick with it. So thanks for listening, and uh, yeah, hope the conference uh, is a great success. Thanks. I have a comment uh, to the presentation of Professor McGorry, and the comment is, I think a key message uh, of uh, this presentation was that uh, we have to move towards uh, a framework uh, of uh, personalized, uh, we can call it a personalized medicine approach to psychiatry and to mental health. So the 
trying to, to finding the right treatment for people and understanding that different treatments can be useful for, for different people. But to this, uh, to this respect, we need two big changes. First change is that we need the services able to offer a variety of treatment without the competition between one paradigm and another paradigm. Some people may need the medication, for an antipsychotic medication. Other people, even with psychotic symptoms, doesn't need antipsychotic medication, probably. And even psychotherapy, some people may need a specific, specified psychotherapeutic approach, and another, other, other kind of people may need other kind of psychotherapeutic approach. The second um, change is in research. We need uh, to, uh, to put forward research focused not only on comparison between treatments, but on looking at which treatments fits, uh, fits uh, some people with some characteristics. So looking at whether, in the, looking at research focused on individualized treatment and trying to identify uh, predictor or indicators showing us which treatment can be more effective for, for, for some people. Thanks.